Hi, I'm Jonathan Edwards, and I want to welcome you to the Jed Breaks Bread podcast. My goal in this podcast is to teach the truth of the Word of God and apply it to our lives that our orthopraxy might be as good as our orthodoxy. May you be blessed. Welcome back, dear friends, and thank you for joining me once again. Today we want to get into our topic of conversation, and that is the spheres of domestic and church authority. And, you know, we've been discussing this creation ordinance of dominion, and that led us down the road of understanding, or I should say, in trying to understand and look at and examine how God has established different spheres of authority and has given leadership to individuals within those spheres or even entities within those spheres, as is the case with governing authority. And we want to be very mindful that these authorities have been established by God for God's purposes, and they are absolute authorities. But just because you have the authority doesn't mean you get to rule in an absolute sense, as a dictator. Okay, let's make that distinction. These are absolute authorities, but that does not give you the right to rule in an absolute sense if you happen to possess a certain authority over someone else. God expects that those who are his children, those who abide by his laws, who know Jesus as Savior, will rule and reign in a way that is consistent with his revealed will. Moreover, I believe that you could prove from the scriptures that there is an expectation that God has that even those who don't acknowledge him as God or who are not genuine believers should rule and reign in a way that is consistent with God's revealed will. Uh, We see some evidence for this in Romans chapter 2 where Paul talks about how Gentiles who do not have the law of God instinctively do the law of God because the law of God is in some sense written upon their consciences. And I don't want to get into a a real philosophical discussion or too far off on a rabbit trail regarding that particular topic. But know this, that God has established authorities And those authorities that God has established are purposeful, and God expects his creatures to honor him as they execute their authority, okay? God expects his creatures, that's man, okay, primarily man, to honor him as they execute his authority. In in his sovereignty, God knows that that is not going to happen because men are wicked. They're sinful. They are rebellious. And so, of course, there are going to be men who gain positions of authority and gain power and do not use it in a manner that is consistent with God's revealed word. That does not mean that the authority structure is bad. This is very important to understand. When man who is sinful abuses the authority that has been bestowed upon him by God, that does not mean the authority is bad. Rather, it means the individual is bad. He is not using the authority wisely or rightly. And I feel compelled, I feel compelled to bring this point up because that is one of the consistent critiques against God's authority structures. It is one of the consistent secular critiques against God's authority in general and why people refuse to believe in God. They say, well, if God is sovereign and powerful, how come he lets wicked people do wicked things? Well, God has a plan and a purpose for allowing wicked people to do wicked things. And they say, well, how come God didn't create different systems? Well, the system is not the problem. The problem is sin that has corrupted the systems that God created. So what you need to do when you get into discussion with somebody who is rejecting the authority of God and the authority and structures that God has designed is communicate to them that the the system put in place by the creator is not the problem. 
It is the sinful man who is the problem. And you should say to that individual, how have you dealt with your sin? How are you dealing with the sin in your own life? Are you being submissive to the will of God? Have you repented of that sin? Are you trying to live according to God's moral commands? And you can take that conversation and very quickly and easily turn it into an opportunity to share the gospel and to witness with someone. So I wanted to begin with that little precursor because we're going to be talking about the sphere of domestic authority and possibly the sphere of church authority. I I may get into that, but I don't know time-wise if I'll have a chance to do so or not. People are very concerned about the sphere of domestic authority because of the abuses that they've either witnessed in their own personal life or that they've witnessed in society in general. And I will agree, and I will cede the point that due to the sinfulness of man, domestic authority and its practice has been greatly abused. And I would say it has been abused by both non-Christians and by Christians. And when we talk about domestic authority, it's very important that we look at the biblical context, we look at the verses in their context, and we don't try to basically make a proof text that enables one individual to be a dictator in the domestic sphere of authority or requires that both partners are exactly equal to avoid a dictatorship. So we have to be able to say what the Bible says and then talk about how to apply the truth of the scriptures without perverting the truth of the scriptures. So we recognize some people have misused it to make husbands the dictators over their wives. And some people, because of those abuses, have responded by saying, there is no authority in the home. There is equal submission. Um, Men and women are totally equal to one another, and therefore there is no leadership in the home. It's a joint leadership. Everything is equal. We recognize that those are two extremes, and neither of those are God's ideal, and neither of those positions are taught in Scripture. You will find people who argue them from the Scriptures, but they're not being honest with the text. That's what I'm trying to say. They're not being honest with the text. So let's now talk about this sphere of domestic authority, okay? The husband is the head of the wife, okay? The husband is the head of the wife. And I want to define what head or headship means, okay? Head or headship is a responsibility and authority to rule, all right? So if you are the head of something, you have been given a responsibility and the authority to rule in that particular sphere. You could be the head of a company. You could be the head of um, a governmental agency. You could be the head of a country. But in this case, we're talking about the head of the household, and that is the husband. The husband is the head of the household. And the, the biblical support for this is drawn from Ephesians chapter 5, okay? And it is one of the um, most disliked passages in contemporary Christianity because it talks about wives being submissive to their husbands. And it gives the exact reason why wives are to be submissive to their husbands and why husbands are the head over the wife. And the answer is Christ is the head of the church. And so, Christ being the head of the church is analogous to the husband being the head of the wife. So Christ is the groom and the church is the bride. Christ is the groom, the church is the bride. Notice, who has the authority? The groom. The groom has the authority. That would be Christ. And who is to submit to the authority? That is the bride, that is the church. And Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 that the relationship between the man and the woman who get married, the husband and wife, is 
analogous to Christ and the church. So let me read this passage to you so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. So there we see the analogy spelled out very clearly. As the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. So this um, relationship of headship and submission is a natural relationship that imitates the relationship between Christ and the church. It also imitates the relationship that God the Father has with Jesus Christ. So God the Father is the head of Christ, and Christ is the head of man, and man is the head of woman. That's what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3, that God is the head of Christ, and Christ is the head of man, and man is the head of woman. This is a natural progression. This is a natural delegation of authority, a natural representation of the spheres of authority. And the problem, again, is not with the structure that God created. The problem is that sinful man has perverted biblical headship and has used his God-given authority to exploit his wife and his children to his own self-centered gain. That's the real problem. That sinful man has perverted his responsibility to act in a way consistent with God's revealed will and according to God's decrees. Sinful man uses his authority that has been established by God for his own self interests and his own self centered gain. And my friends, that is the real issue here. It is not the issue of the structures that God created. It is the issue of man's sinfulness and how he perverts what is good and he uses it in a way that is evil. That's the real issue here. So let's also take a look at some of the biblical support for this idea and this concept that man is the head of the woman. So if we appeal to the creation account, okay, these are, of course, creation ordinances. If we appeal to the creation account, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 2, and we are going to take a look at some verses here in Genesis chapter 2. First of all, we see this, that there is a certain order of creation, and that order of creation establishes man as the head. All right? So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we see that the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. So man was created first. Then all the other animals, uh, land animals were made, and they were brought to Adam, and he named them on the morning of, of the morning of the sixth day. And after he got done naming them, he realized that there was no helper suitable for him. So all these other animals had partners. For Adam, there was found no partner. So in Genesis 2.18, God says, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable to him, a helpmate. And the, the very nature of the word helpmate means one who is going to come alongside, not one who is going to stand in front of, not one who is going to take the lead, but one who is going to come alongside. And so in Genesis 2.18, we see that God makes this declaration that Adam needs a helpmate. Then in Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 to 22, God fashions a woman from the rib of the man, and then he brings her to Adam, and Adam names her. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Typically, when you name something, it means you have ownership over them or possession of them. And again, because of our perverted society, there is a temptation to take that drastically different than it is intended. 
Just because Adam named Eve doesn't mean that he possessed her as if he was a master and she was a slave. It means that he took a rightful ownership over her. That means a loving responsibility to care for her, to protect her, to lead her, to guide her, to honor her. He was taking possession of her as his wife. All right. And then what does it say? The verse 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And and this continues. This very tradition continues of a man naming a woman. And you think, well, wait a minute. You don't even know who you're going to marry at birth. That's correct. You don't know who you're going to marry at birth. But upon marriage, the woman takes the last name of the husband. And that is significant because it demonstrates this loving ownership and possession that she belongs to him. This woman is no longer free to explore the open market of uh, single men. She is now under the possession of a particular man. And that is a very God-honoring thing because it, it, first of all, establishes families. Secondly, it provides protection. Third, it provides an opportunity for her to fulfill her duty as a helpmate and the man to fulfill his duty as the head who is responsible. And even though many sinful men and even many Christian men err in how they practice headship, uh, there is a, a judge that they will answer to. So when sinful man, when sinful man screws up and makes mistakes, the unbelieving world, or even some well-meaning Christians say, you know what? We have to do away with this sphere of authority. No, no, no. That's not what we're going to do. We're going to keep the sphere that God created, and we are going to challenge and appeal to the individuals living within the sphere to do what is just according to the Word of God. And ultimately, I recognize, I'm just going to speak personally, but this is applicable to every husband, I recognize that my ultimate responsibility is to Jesus Christ, my Lord, and that the way that I interact with my wife and children will be judged by Christ. So if I abuse the headship, if I abuse my position of authority, Jesus will judge that on the day of judgment. And I will be receiving a consequence far greater than any consequence a, a human being could bring upon me. All right. That, that, my friends, is a motivation for husbands to mind their authority and to do what is right. Again, I feel the need to re-emphasize that just because a sphere of authority exists, it does not mean that the people who are in the sphere are inferior to one another. So the wife is not inferior to the husband because she has to submit to him. The husband is not superior to the wife because he has a um, responsibility over her. That is not the case at all. Rather, they are both equal. They are made in the image of God, but they have been given different roles and functions to fulfill within the sphere of domestic authority. We call this complementarianism, all right? Man and woman were created to complement one another. They are equal, but they fulfill different roles and functions. So when we're looking at the ordinance of dominion and we look at authority within the home, we see this is what God established from the very beginning, and it is confirmed in the New Testament. Now, the authority of a, a husband over his wife is not the only authority that is present within the domestic sphere. There is another authority, and that is fathers and mothers as authorities over their children. Okay? Fathers and mothers as authorities over their children. Now, because of the first issue that we talked about, fathers are the final authority over the household. But fathers and mothers have a joint authority over their children, and they have a joint responsibility to nurture and care for and to discipline their children. Notice that in the Ten Commandments, it says, 
for children to honor your father and mother. It doesn't just say honor your father. It says honor your father and mother. So children in the domestic sphere of authority have a responsibility to submit to and obey mom as much as they submit to and obey dad. That is good and honorable. Now, fathers in particular have a special responsibility to exercise their authority over their children with kindness and gentleness and with the goal of producing who uh, the goal of producing children who fear God and respect other men. Twice in the New Testament, Paul forbids fathers from exasperating their children. That means to be unnecessarily harsh, unnecessarily demeaning or degrading. Yes, fathers, you are stronger and more powerful, and you have this great um, reverence that children look up to, but you should never abuse that to such a degree that you exasperate your children and you make them dislike you as a father or dislike fathers in general. Instead, what fathers ought to do is to be talking about the ways of the Lord and the truths of God in every aspect and area of life as commanded by Moses to the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 13, God says uh, to Moses that um, he is one, okay? The Lord your God is one. And then he gives instructions to fathers that they are to teach all of the commands and the statutes and the laws that were commanded to Moses. They were to teach them to their sons and to their grandsons, and they were to do it as they go about the course of daily life. This is a very important truth. Okay, this is a very, very important truth. Fathers have a responsibility, that is part of their headship, to teach the laws of God to their children. So headship may seem like, hey, you have got this great and mighty power because you're the boss and what you say goes and you get to say whatever you want to say. Well, that's, that's looking at it from one perspective. But the other perspective is that headship, headship brings a great responsibility that you will be held accountable for. All right. Headship is a serious task and you must be serious minded about the task. Young fathers out there, don't don't slough off on this task. Don't be lazy about it. Learn what it means to be a godly leader to your wife and a godly father to your children. Practice. Continue to get better. Don't settle for good enough. All right, we need to imitate God our fathers headship over his creation in how we manage our own household and how we treat our wives and we treat our children. All right, so clearly I did not make it to church authority, and I'll have to do that in the next episode. But right now I want to briefly touch on a, a really important question, and I want to, I'm going to give you a brief answer now, but I'm going to expound on it further in the next episode. And this question is basically, at what point do I disobey an authority that is over me? All right, so we've talked about the sphere of governmental authority. Today, we've talked about the sphere of domestic authority. Uh, next time, we're going to talk about the sphere of church authority. And a key question is, is there ever a point in which I should disobey that authority? The answer to that is yes, there is a point in which you disobey that authority. and the the point of disobedience is when someone who is an authority over you commands you to act in a way that would violate the revealed will of God. When an authority figure commands you to violate the known truths that you find in God's word. So for example, if um, your husband asks you to steal for him, then you should not obey your husband because you would be violating the law of God. If the government asks you to not 
preach the gospel, then you need to disobey the government and continue to preach the gospel because that is our mandate as Christians to preach the gospel. This is a very simplistic explanation um, because, first of all, it is simple. We obey God rather than men. So when man asks us to do something sinful, we obey God rather than man. But the nuances of the application become very difficult and become very overwhelming. And I know that for a lot of us, we've had to wrestle with this question because of the last two years of governmental restrictions upon individual freedom and liberty in order to to restrict the spread of the COVID-19 virus. So um, that's the simple answer for now. And I will get back to answering that in more detail in the next episode. And that will actually fit really well with the sphere of church authority. All right. Well, thank you all for your time and attention today. I pray God's blessings upon you. And I pray that you would have real wisdom as how to implement these truths into your life. God bless you. May you continue to serve him with your whole heart.